the Easter Island statue project is an archaeological inventory and database project that has produced a stylistic analysis of nearly 900 monolithic statues, the Moai. Uh, Dr. Joanne van Tilburg's work focuses on the landscape and how art and history and ecology work together, uh, the relation between those. Uh, but her work is also really important, um, or what is really important in her work, is the relation to the local population of Rapa Nui. She's an appointed member of the National Landmarks Committee, the US National Park Service Advisory Board. Uh, as a researcher, she's associated with the Coatesen Institute of Archaeology at UCLA, uh, where she directs the UCLA Rock Art Archive. And in 2001, she and this archive received the California Governor's Award for Historic Preservation. She's also a fellow of the Royal Geographic Society. She has published a, a number of wonderful books. They're always, uh, of course, extremely interesting in content and beautifully designed. Um, so this, this whole integration of art and archaeology is, is at the core of both the content and uh, the shape of her work. Her most recent field project is the digital mapping of the interior of Rano Raraku statue quarry on Eastern Island. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Joanne van Tilburg. Good morning, everyone. What I'm going to be talking with you today about is of course, as Willeke so kindly and generously said, my work on Easter Island. And I'm going to also give you a kind of thumbnail sketch, a short history of resources, craft, and the kinds of social actions that had to take place on Easter Island in order for this remote Polynesian island in the Southeastern Pacific to become really central to the world's radar of creativity in Polynesia. And basically, the words that you will hear repeatedly from me, I fear, is include vaca, and vaca is a proto-Polynesian word which indicates canoe. Canoe, of course, is the basic mode of transportation for the settlement of the Pacific, but it is also basically the moving platform upon which what Ben Finney so long ago called the family of the canoe. And it also encompassed the house societies that are basic to the island Southeast Asia social organizational system. And from these, the, the coming together really of the concept of family and of shelter, but also a, a really remarkable kind of moving shelter, which was the canoe. The issue of, and the concept of communitas emerged in Polynesia. And that is basically at the center and at the root of the accomplishment of the Rapa Nui people in the creation of a megalithic society. That is the idea of communitas, the, the idea of how people who know each other well, are related, speak the same language, have the same cultural history, and transported over thousands of miles of open ocean can come together, share, work together, and create something that has caused me to dedicate three three decades of my research life to it, but also brought all of you here today. So we can think about and talk about the accomplishments of the Rapa Nui community. Easter Island is 164 square kilometers, about 64 square miles. It's small, it's remote, and it's lying basically um, between the coast of South America and Tahiti midway. So to get to Easter Island, you would fly from Santiago, Chile, in the same way that to get to Hawaii, you would fly from Los Angeles. Same amount of time, same type of journey. It's a modern island, very well connected in the digital age, and quite interesting in terms of the um, adventure opportunities provided to tourism and so on. So, and the island itself, as you can see here, was formed by the coalescing flows of three volcanoes, submarine volcanoes, this being one of those formative volcanoes known as Ranukau. We're not going to be talking about Ranukau today, although it is the center of a very, very interesting transformation of Rapa Nui culture and megalithic architecture. 
Um, the interesting thing I think it, to point out at this uh, juncture is that um, while all of the islands that you see here are culturally Polynesian or Micronesian or related to island Southeast Asia and uh, the, the beginnings really of the founding culture of Polynesia, we do have the um, anomaly in a way of South American presence in ancient Polynesia. And that comes from the evidence that we have for that is somewhat um, clouded in, in terms of the genetics, but in terms of um, botany, it is very clear. And that is that the South American cultigen known as the sweet potato has made its way transported by humans into Polynesia. How precisely that happened and when precisely that happened, we don't know yet. But our work that I'm going to be talking to you about today has contributed to a greater understanding of that mystery. And that is very pleasing to, to all of us who've worked on the, on the excavation. You see here two notations in red on the map. Carbonized sweet potato has been found on the island of Mangaya around the beginning of the oh, 15th century or mid 15th century AD. And also we found similar evidence in our excavation at a similar time frame um, on Rapa Nui. So we know that the sweet potato was in these two distant places at more or less the same time. That tells us that it was transported much earlier and quite rapidly. The idea of communitas has two components to it. One is sacred and the other is secular. The basic postulates of the secular um, are really having to do with the power of the local chiefs because all of Polynesia um, is constructed socio-politically as chiefdoms. And some of those chiefdoms are complex. Some are, are what we call simple chiefdoms. Rapa Nui has long been conceptualized as a simple chiefdom. However, we're now moving toward a, 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 an opinion, a research opinion, that that may be slightly off base, that Rapa Nui as a culture may have been more complexly organized than we originally thought. The basic postulates of the sacred are the, is the concept of dualism. On the one hand, mana, which is spiritual power. On the other, tapu, which is the forbidden. Also sanctity, the idea that the chief is descended from the gods, atua. And then the concept of balance, the idea that the sacred and the secular the need to be in balance. When they are not in balance, that causes social dislocation and problems. So we have, have some issues with regard to how the, the, the sacred postulates of Rapa Nui belief and of Polynesian belief um, were enacted in the society. Um, in terms of the secular um, aspect of power and of belief, um, that's concentrated, as you can see here, basically in the head, the eyes, and the genitals of the sacred chiefs descended from gods. So their ability to pass on their identity and their heredity and their legitimacy as chiefs comes from the sacred. Their entire being is sacred. And in places like Hawaii or Samoa or Tonga, um, any misstep in the community with regard to the treatment of chiefs and their sanctity resulted in instant death. So this is a concept that um, is united and is, is very well integrated. Um, and the two key parts of it are the sanctity of the chief, his sacred body. And on Easter Island, the fact that the chiefs were portrayed, chief known as Riki, were portrayed in stone. So the concept of the sacred was passed into, through ritual, the actual stone figure representing the chief. This is something rather new um, in Polynesia and is centered primarily in Eastern Polynesia. The idea of craft specialization, which we're gonna be talking about today, just to be clear on what it is we're talking about, Craft is not art per se. Craft is a process. And the concept within that process is the idea of controlling and teaching and mentoring and passing on what you know 
to a colleague or the next generation. And craft, of course, is based on technology. Technology of Rapa Nui was a Stone Age culture. So naturally, they were using stone tools. And then you'll hear me mention design often. And design, as we think of it in this context, is really the ability to imagine ways to create something that has inherent within it the ability to allow the craftsperson, who's a learned maker of art, to generate respect, not only for what it is he's creating or she's creating, but for that person as an artist and the artist's ability. Because the artist's ability to create and to pass on to the next generation is demonstrated mana, demonstrated power in the service of community. And what we see here, this um, interesting photograph, is of seven statues on Easter Island on a single site that are within centimeters of, of one another in terms of their design features. They are perfect replicas, one to the other. This is a very interesting um, thing that Rapa Nui artists um, were able to accomplish and who put a great deal of emphasis on this ability to replicate and reproduce over time the same object. There is a word in Rapa Nui which basically translates to craft specialization and it's haka maori. And basically it means to make an expert. So it really encompasses, as you can tell within it, the idea of teaching, the idea of passing on, the idea of inheriting the mana to create a beautiful object and the objects uh, concept itself. So this is a, I'm simplifying obviously, but this is a very, very complex interaction of art and power. And this idea is what we call in Polynesia, the culture of craft. And basically, as you can see from this map, Rapa Nui is not the only culture that produced stone sculpture, but it is the only culture that produced it in nearly perfect repetition and specifically as monolithic anthropomorphic um, figures. So they on Rapa Nui were really looking at customizing and replicating the idea of the human body. Whereas, as you can see elsewhere in Polynesia, there were more abstract forms. There were portable figures as well as uh, monolithic figures. And there were some that were oddly idiosyncratic. In other words, looked less human than, than the Rapa Nui figures did. So basically what the culture of craft tells us about Polynesia in general is that the farther, further eastward um, Polynesian migrations reached, the, the stronger the concept of, of depicting the power of the chief as an anthropomorphic figure emerged. And it is only on Rapa Nui that it emerged in a very clear anthropomorphic form. Simplified, of course, not too many attributes, but clearly recognizable as human. So basically, um, the other thing that we have found in our, in our inventory, and I will talk with you a little bit more about this, is that Rapa Nui craftspeople um, were not only engaged in work that produced statues, but they were engaged in work that produced houses as well. And house building as an honored craft goes all the way back to Tonga and Samoa, the formative cultures of West Polynesia. So basically we have um, a situation whereby, and linguistically, as you can see on the screen, the concept of craftsmanship and is, is supported by, by language, by the evolution of the Austronesian and Polynesian languages. So my observation is that as we will see, as we proceed through this discussion together, um, there was a change in Rapa Nui society and there was a collapse more, to speak, more or less of craftsmanship, of the ability to create the same object and replicate it over time. But that wasn't the only place that that um, change or transformation is evident. It was also evident in the house foundations. 
So my observation, which I will talk with you more about, is that the fall of the statues, as we know, took place sometime late in Rapa Nui prehistory, and the destruction of elite houses, which we know also took place, um, is something that's intertwined with the position and the role of craftspeople and their status and rank on Rapa Nui over time. We're not quite sure about all the ramifications of this. Many people are writing and thinking about it. My colleagues in, in Polynesian archaeology and Rapa Nui studies are very interested in this topic and there are myriad ideas about it. But what I'm suggesting here is that over time, there was a change in the, in the status of Rapa Nui carvers and their product. And by extension, the chiefly uh, motivation for that product that caused um, a destructive turn in Rapa Nui prehistory. And it's evident both in the statues and in house construction. So how do we know what we think we know about Easter Island? What you see here is a display map from our project. This was created by Alice Hom, who's my colleague in, the, in well, basically in everything having to do with Easter Island. These little dots that you see on this map represent 20,000 um, or more sites in specific regions or areas for a total of triple that, maybe quadruple that in terms of uh, uh, coverage and, and numbers and types of sites. So when we look at these little dots, we can discern that about 4,000 of them represent houses. And doing quick calculations, size of families and size of houses and so on, we can project now based on the work, not just of ourselves, but of 15 separate archeologists who have worked on Rapa Nui and who were kind enough to share their data with us that the, dis the distribution of houses and the number of houses and the types of houses and the extent of the coverage of archeology span on Rapa Nui strongly suggest to us that there was a population of a minimum of 20,000 people living there. And that 20,000 people, that group, constitutes over 120 people per um, kilometer, per square kilometer on Rapa Nui. So this is a pretty significant population. And this population is capable of, and was for a long time, of producing the food and the tools um, and the support required for the carvers and the craftspeople to produce the megalithic culture of Rapa Nui. So this is no longer terribly mysterious in terms of how in the world could they have done it. They did it because there were lots of people, lots of people working at many different tasks, and lots of people providing food for those who were working. So, and again, I mentioned that all the names across the bottom of your screen are the people who have contributed to this database that you see in front of you. What we have done is to focus specifically for three decades now on the statues. So our archeological survey database, which was um, based on my legacy material from um, my original dissertation back in 1986 or so, um, our database now has, in, as you can see in front of you, over 16,000 sites or groups, and then many hundreds of objects related to it. So we now have a searchable database that will allow um, conservation and archeological study for the next several generations. We've also um, been able to pare down our database to those that are the best documented. And the best documented are those that have measurements in the categories you see here, and for which we have drawings and other visual materials, and for which we've done some parametric models to test the efficacy of our, of our measurements. So we're quite confident that the subset we've created um, and which is being studied by colleagues I'm working with at the Kontiki Museum in Norway 
Um, we have handed over that data and they have come back testing our um, three phases of stylistic development. So we now know based on a subset of statues that are very, very well documented on Easter Island, we now can see that there's a very tight clustering of, of attributes in certain categories. And we have three phases of development for the statues based primarily on size, uh, height and volume and so on, but on other characteristics as well. The key to this, the reason it's so important in terms of research is that we, we're consistent now, much more consistent perhaps than in the past, but we also see continuity and affinity within um, this collection of material. And that helps us to, to, excuse me, to engage with questions such as, was Rapa Nui culture ever interrupted by another culture, for example? It has frequently been said that there's a South American connection to Rapa Nui um, and that some people have speculated that certain types of art in the, on the mainland of South America are related to Rapa Nui art. But we can see that the sculpture, as we know it, in terms of its monolithic characteristics, did not change in terms of interruption, but it changed in terms of gradual evolution over time. So those of you who have followed the sorts of crises we've faced during this pandemic, as we all remain sequestered and trying to do our best to move this thing forward in a positive way, we have seen eruptions of anger in our country where um, statues have been thrown to the ground. Those statues of individuals, human individuals, not godly individuals, um, are part of our public art um, interest as a culture. So we have many sites in our, in our, on our, in our country that um, represent history and represent people and people who have individual people who have accomplished something that the group honors. So I want you to think about that activity in terms of Rapa Nui today, because public art, no matter where it appears, and certainly it exists on Rapa Nui, has certain characteristics. And what we've been able to do now is define what we think the characteristics of public art are uh, on Rapa Nui. And we know, for example, that in order to produce public art, you have to have leadership. You have to have cooperation. You have to be able to reward the people who are working to create public art. And public art, suggests to those who participate in creating it, continuity. It suggests longevity. In the end, in a way, it suggests safety. And the, the goals really of public art are different for the individuals who create them than they are for the individuals who inspire them. But public art is always important because it tells us something about the group we're part of and what we have accomplished. It takes place most of the time and is established in a shared space. It helps us to understand who we are, creates our identity or signifies it to us. But it also repeats and replicates some key message that the people who have created it and inspired it want the larger community to grasp. From the standpoint of economics, public art creates resources, but it also consumes resources. And in some cases, it destroys resources. In order to build all these wonderful uh, sites of public art on Rapa Nui, um, trees had to be cut down. Things, life had to change. Rules were established as to where people could live in relation to public art. So these were all very, very important repercussions, but also basic um, considerations of public art, no matter where it took place. But in the end, public art either requests, demands, or forces some sort of responsive action on the part of the community. In our world, in our life today, that responsive action was anger in many cases. It was on Rapa Nui as well. 
small sculptures, portable sculptures, are really private, and there are many of them on Rapa Nui. What we have done over the last, since 2000, is visit 37 institutions worldwide and document 494 objects from Rapa Nui in order to determine whether or not, again, there's any severing, if you will, of the design concept that would indicate some sort of um, new presence on the island or some sort of rapid, unusual change. And we've looked at 80 carvings that are very, very special that were pointed out to me by Dr. Adrian Kepler of the Smithsonian Institution. She had herself already isolated and validated them as being early objects from Rapa Nui. That is, of course, her great gift and skill that she's able to mine museum records as she does with such intensity. She came back with 80 objects um, that she suggested we might want to have a look at and published her information about those objects. So they became the center of our study. And we found through the ethnographic work we did and so on, that portable figures, no matter what material they're in, wood, stone, bark cloth, um, really are based on, as Adrian had long suggested, the ideal of the crescent and of curved lines. And that in general, the representation there was not of chiefs who were great gods, but really of ancestors who were honored and valued. So we now see a kind of break between monolithic and portable sculptures, um, high place chiefly gods and lower ranked ancestral spirits. Some of these small objects are still found in agricultural fields today when they're made of stone. And then further work again between Adrian and myself has established and with in this, I've been helped with by Wendy All, who does a lot of illustrations for us. Of course, again, by, by Alice Hom and by, by many other museum curators and other um, uh, researchers who are focused on Rapa Nui portable art. What we found is that the crescent, as Adrian had long expected, is at the heart of all Rapa Nui design. And we can show that. We have ways of discussing that. And what the Rapa Nui people do is call that crescent, no matter where it appears, vaca or canoe. Four or five other objects that you see listed on your screen here are sacred icons on Rapa Nui and every single one of them depends upon the manipulation of the crescent for its creation. And then we know that among 15 or 17 other design elements that are traced back to the far Western Pacific, there are some that are inherent, of course, in Rapa Nui design. So this kind of iconographic study grew out of the larger um, work that we've been doing with the excavation and the survey. And we now find ourselves very satisfied and very rewarded by the, the outcomes of, of those studies. These have been concurrent with the archaeological fieldwork. And so now I want to speak to you briefly about community archaeology and heritage conservation. This is what we call in our project the MANA Initiative. We work here. This is our site. It's called Rapa Nui's Statue Quarry, Rano Raraku. Rano means lake. Raraku is the name of the place of the mountain itself. It's a geological feature. The rim that you see here is between 800 and 1,000 meters high. We have worked inside here in the inner quarry region where the red triangle is indicated um, since 2000. First mapping and then excavating. In our mapping project, we've captured 15,400 survey points locating 900 sculptural objects, 469 of them um, are in the quarry, 900 is island-wide, and of these there are 150 in the interior. 65 of them are upright in place. We've been excavating two that are upright and two that are still attached to the bedrock. We have produced this map of the inner region, which locates every single statue and carving canal and object of interest. Um, this was done in the field, 
the statues themselves and all of the features were drawn in the field with a survey, um, uh, with a surveyor at his right hand by Christian Arevalo Pacarati, who has worked with us since 1989, something like that. So then each of these objects was traced in the lab by Alice Hahn, and we ended up with this very illustrative um, map that has been very, very useful to research. Each of those numbers is attached to an entire record um, of um, a visual record, metric records, conservation records, and so on. In our excavation, I want to talk to you briefly about what we did and what we've learned. We use traditional methods of excavation, including screening and sampling. And this is our site. We work inside the quarry where the red triangle is annotated on these maps. Each of the blue dots or greenish blue dots um, was collected. That's a survey point collected by Matt Bates, who was then at Cal Poly, who was our surveyor. And this, of course, is what the interior looks like. The dotted lines indicate 17 unique quarries, each of which we believe, or we hypothesize, was assigned to a family group. And the statues themselves are all carved on the upper portion of the bedrock flow. And the red triangle indicates number 157 and 156, which are the statues we have excavated. The other statues, number eight and number nine, our statues on bedrock that we have excavated as well. So you can see, I think very clearly, that we're at the lower end of the slope, not at the very high, steepest portion of the slope, which was very comfortable because that's, that was dangerous. <laughs> this is what the, the bedrock quarries themselves look like once they're cleared. You can see that they're still unfinished, still attached to bedrock, and that the statues themselves were just hewn basically as cubes. And then the features added to the top, statues undercut so they could be removed. Where we are at the top of the slope, we've discovered another statue that's buried. And with the help of Greg Downing, we have done certain kinds of 3D visualization of the excavation, which has been very helpful. And specifically focused, which was one of actually the motivations for, um, for actually um, excavating these two standing statues, the fact that they're covered on the back with petroglyphs. Petroglyphs are crescents. Crescents are called vaca in Rapanui. And as you can see here, each one is drawn and measured, and then the color code indicates what category of motif they belong to. Interestingly enough, when we got to the bottom of 157, we found a small boulder that was tucked under the base of the statue that has on it a prototypical canoe with a steering paddle. The, the record for the, um, the rock art on the back of each of these statues is um, personalized to each statue, obviously. But we have, in this case of 157, I think we have 70 plus um, types of vaca, elaborated or not elaborated. Um, and we have all the metrics and all of the interesting features, design features associated with them. This was accomplished by students who worked with us in the Rock Art Archive. And um, in this photograph, you can see with the plan view that we're showing you, each of these two statues, 180, 156 and 157, are standing upright permanently implanted in place. They will never be removed. They are embedded in bedrock. One of them, 157, is standing on a pedestal. 156 is actually embedded in the rock and then a wall carved around it. In effect, we're seeing permanent emplacement of statues upright in the quarry to remain in the quarry to transfer everything associated with public art from the, the large ceremonial sites into what has traditionally been required, regarded as only a production center. So this is a process whereby um, new kinds of activities, ceremonial kinds of activities, have been introduced into an industrial production craft area. When we got to the bottom of one of the statues at five meters, we found this, a very roughly carved boulder of an anthropomorphic head. This is a very interesting object and ties 
the work that we've done here with um, Ron Ocau, the first volcano that I showed you in this presentation, where there was a late eruption of Rapa Nui iconographic creativity and new um, belief system, basically, um, that had to do, we think, with fertility. Now looking at the, the hard archaeology, the hard scientific evidence of what we've done with these, with these excavations. First of all, I want you to note that the statues are embedded in colluvium, which means that everything, all of the dirt around them has come from upslope. Once the quarry was uh, denuded of trees, all of the dirt began to come down. So almost all of the statues standing on the, on the inner slope are in at least five meters of um, soil. And that's what we had. So our challenge was how do we control that soil to understand what it may be able to tell us. So we accomplished that by working with Sarah Sherwood at the University of the South in Tennessee. She's a soils micromorphologist. She inserted this column excavation in our excavation. The profile that you see on the left shows you that we can tell where further or earlier intrusions to this soils compacted area were made by earlier investigators. And we have a very good handle through her column excavation on the various zones and layers of soils. Basically then, once we got to our scientific testing, we were able to determine that our excavation had some very interesting things to teach us. For example, um, in our um, pollen results, we have evidence of Sophora toromio, toromiro, which is a tree now extinct everywhere except in botanical garden. Um, uh, Triumphetta, which is a very important tree on Rapa Nui, was used for, for carving actually and many, many other activities. And then of course we have palm pollen throughout our entire excavation, all the way down to the bottom. So that suggests palm um, may have been standing in or around the quarry up until the end of quarry activity, which I will tell you about in just a moment. We also have evidence of three other types of trees, very, very important, sandalwood, Elphatonia zisifoides, which is in the middle. That's called the um, toy tree in Polynesia. It's very, very important to do things like make rollers to move statues, levers to uh, help lift statues or stone, um, and certainly canoes and rafts. And then we have Thespicia populena, which is called Makoe on Easter Island. Also a very, very prized wood that is reddish on its interior. What we know from the 21 samples of carbon that we've had dated is that the inner region of Ranuvaraku was in, in effect a very, very important garden. And one of the most valued products of that garden is paper mulberry, a tree that's used, the inner bark of which is peeled off and felted to produce clothing and especially to produce capes for priests and chiefs. So, this system of agriculture in Rano Araku, according to Sarah's um, tests, is really to be expected because the deterioration of the stone that was being quarried in the interior itself, down to a clay mixture, was creating very fertile soils. And so there was water there, as you've seen, and very good soil. So the Rapa Nui people not only were producing statues, they were farming in the interior, horticulture, agriculture. Once we got, went through all of our 21 dates, we found five dates that were in very, very good sequence. They're outlined here in blue. And we were able to determine through Bayesian analysis and a modeling of these dates that the statue we excavated, the two standing statues, were likely erected sometime at or before 1455 to 1605 AD. And that quarrying took place and carried on well into the period of first European contact. 
However, looking back at what we've already discussed, it wasn't to take the statues out of the quarry that the work was being carried on to accomplish. It was to keep them in the quarry. And that work from 1665 to 1750 encompasses the year 1722 when the first Europeans arrived from, uh, from abroad. So people were in the quarry, they were carving, they were making things, they were conducting ceremonies, they were burying their dead because we found human remains. And in effect, they had turned the inner portion of the quarry into a ceremonial site itself, one very large ceremonial site, that each of those 17 quarries that we showed you on our map um, served, we believe, individual families in the same way that the ancient ceremonial sites had done by marking territory, erecting uh, chiefly figures, conducting very large ceremonies, sharing food, sharing music, sharing dance, all the things that went into those kinds of celebrations, most of which were associated with the death and the apotheosis of sacred chiefs. They moved that activity into the quarry, grew food there to accommodate it, but each of them stayed in their marked territories, we believe, because our Research is now beginning to show that, our, that there are slight differences between the statues in the interior that are assigned to those individual quarries. Importantly, too, we found the first good excavated evidence of sweet potato on Rapa Nui, suggesting that, of course, for this period of time, the date for which you see on your screen, we know that there was already sweet potato in Mangaya, which is far to the west. So the sweet potato was the staple food on Rapa Nui. It supported the statue industry and it was vital to the consideration of um, and the ability of people to uh, flourish, to provide themselves with all of the food they needed to conduct all of the um, activities that were basic to the expression of themselves as a people. And then the historic endpoint we know was somewhere between 1700 and 1725. It was abandoned and house foundations were ripped out of the ground. Life ended more or less in terms of the kinds of things that were going on inside the quarry. So now we move to um, the hard, not so much interesting always work. Sometimes it's tedious, but we have a lot of um, archiving and correlating but we now know that tools were actually made and used in the quarry, not elsewhere. Most of the tools that are in the center portion of your, of your screen all came, the stone for them all came from the same quarry. So there was a specialized quarry that provided the stone for this specialized object, which is the statue. And with the help of Chris Fisher at UCLA and um, Monica Bajomundes, in the Consejo for Conservation in Santiago, and then local people working with us as usual. We had a site monitoring station, a, a weather station implanted on our site, and we kept five years of data. We conducted certain kinds of, of um, conservation activities, cleaning of lichens, applying uh, solutions that were meant to consolidate the stone and present it, prevent it from being damaged by rain and so on, and a certain number of conservation solutions and um, activities were recommended to the government of Chile and also to the community of Estrada, including data management and application of protective treatments that we know work and so on. To date, largely because of the, of the corona pandemic, most of these actions have not been taken and await being taken. So I close now with a quote from one of my favorite anthropologists, Roy Rappaport. He said, not with regard to Easter Island, but in general, the demonstration of sanctity and the generation of communitas rests on ritually imposed temples, repetitiveness, and rhythms. And we know that repetitiveness, repetitiveness and rhythm and replication and um, are all parts of um, the way in which Rapa Nui people express themselves. These are qualities that they value in their arts. They do not value innovation. They do not value doing something utterly different 
from what has been done in the past. They like tradition, they like continuity, they like affinity, they like identity confirmed through art. And to this day, that is still true. However, as Rappaport further noted, if a continuously downward trajectory produces or exacerbates food shortages, then we have a very significant challenge in which the balance between sanctity and authority gets inverted and then challenged. And I would put it to you that that is probably what happened in a nutshell on Rapa Nui so long ago. So I will close with this concept, I think, of looking forward, which is that all of the archeological fieldwork publications, reconstructions that we've all worked for, not just me, but 15 or 20 other archeologists and their international teams, um, have been very good for the Rapa Nui economy and for the encouragement of tourism, particularly the work of Tor Heyerdahl, I would point to. But right now what the Rapa Nui people have to decide is that what they, is, if that is what they want. Is that the community, communitas, that they envision for the future, one in which they host hordes of international visitors? But they will come to the realization soon that conservation of the Moai is absolutely vital to their economy. It is the essential underpinning of their economy. It is why people come to Rapa Nui. So what I await with eagerness is the new definition of Rapa Nui Comunitas, because I know it's forthcoming. They're very creative people and they have met challenges far greater than what we see today. So I thank you for your interest and your appreciation of Rapa Nui and its prehistory. We'll leave you with just a few um, vignettes of people who have worked their hearts out on this project and agencies and organizations that have worked to support us. Thank you very much.